Well, hey, Gundam Maniacs, welcome to another episode of Gundam Explained. In this episode, we're going to actually talk about something that may or may not be canon, and actually, no, I guess canon is not the right way to put it, because it's possible that this is something that's not owned by Bandai, even though they make things in its property, and I know that's confusing, but this is about Gundam Sentinel. If you're a big Gundam fan, you may know about Sentinel because of the awesome designs, the revolutionary designs it has, and a pretty neat story, and people always ask, when's the Sentinel anime gonna come out? But with the kind of digging around about Gundam I do online, I came across something that says that Bandai doesn't actually own Gundam Sentinel. What does that mean? Well, let's get into it. But before we get started, if you haven't, please subscribe. If you think it's a cool video, give it a like. Check the links in the description for ways you could support the channel. Also, check out our Discord. We have a lot of fun there. But let's get started. Okay, and so for a quick overview for those that may not know about Sentinel, which is fine because it, it's it's one of those things where if you're a, a deep and hardcore Gundam fan, you may know Sentinel. But if you just know it on the surface, you may not know about it because it's not around as much as you think. There's no anime. So Gundam Sentinel is an original story which takes place in the Universal Century timeline set during the same timeline as Double Zeta which is the sequel to Zeta. After the fall of the Titans, Earth sends an expeditionary force called Task Force Alpha to deal with a group of elite Federation officers who form their own Earth supremacist faction called the New Decides. Conceptualized in the fall of 1987, so that's still early in the Gundam kind of IP life, the Japanese magazine Model Graphics began serializing a monthly Gundam novel named Gundam Sentinel. It ran from September 1987 to August 1988. It was a groundbreaking combination for a Gundam novel featuring extremely detailed mechanical designs by Kotoki Hajime, which most of you may be familiar with. There's the Verka version Kotoki. Uh, isn't there like a cost signature also line of like Robot Spirits, Gunpla, uh, Master Grades? Gundam Sentinel being his debut, paving the way to his becoming the main mechanical designer for the Gundam franchise and the technically detailed storyline between veteran Gundam fan Masaya Takahashi, writer of the MS Senki comic called Gundam Sentinel, The Confessions of Alice. The story realistically depicts mobile suits as military equipment rather than heroic robots. After Gundam Sentinel completed its run, model graphics combined all the work, and with the addition of new material, it was published as Gundam Wars 3, Gundam Sentinel, The Battle of Real Gundam. The story was republished in July 1990 as novel subtitled Confessions of Alice. So, really cool story. Some of you may even be familiar with the look of the Sentinel. It's appeared in some games. It's in GBO2. There's model kits of it. I mean, it's just a sick looking design. And again, uh, Kotoki Hajime, who was the one that made this design, went on to make some other designs, reimagining designs for other Gundam properties, Vid Wing. But one thing people always ask for is an anime, a Sentinel anime, and we haven't got it. And it, it, there could be many reasons for that. One, it's an old story. But there's something that I came across I thought was interesting, and that is that Bandai slash Sunrise doesn't actually own Sentinel, but how is that possible? Well, boys and girls, strap on your seatbelts. I'm about to go into old type mode. Not that I'm going to read this blog post, but there's a blog post done back in 2009, um, and it was actually translated on Reddit. So shout out to Hat Janeer five years ago that put this here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. Yeah, be prepared. It's long. Gundam Sentinel had an undeniable influence on the rest of the franchise following it. Yet it was never given an anime. Behind the strange phenomenon hides a tale written by Sunrise Bandai's hostile manipulation as a business. I am but a humble little hobbyist, so I'm merely writing down what I know to allow fellow Gundam fans to reminisce the nostalgia of their years spent wondering why there never came a Gundam Sentinel anime. Read on and see for yourself. When speaking of Gundam Sentinel, one must mention its writer, Masaya Takahashi who may be before the time of some younger Gundam fans, but this man, back in the early 1980s Gundam boom, was a pioneer in canonizing Gundam mechanical designs. He teamed up with Masahiro Oda and Katsumi Kawaguchi, yes, that's the Majin, to form the extremely popular stream-based modeling collect, and the three of them were responsible for mobile suit variations in Playmo Kiyoshiro, setting off a wave of fandom for Gundam and f allowing the Gunpla Hobby to become what it is today. Within the group, Takahashi was responsible for a portion of the MSV mechanical designs and background story. So a large chunk of anything we see nowadays are derivative works with his creations as the basis. Larmor Gundam, Goo Flight Type, GM Sniper Custom, for example. Wow. Based on all this, one would think his relationship with Sunrise Bandai would be extremely peachy. So what caused everything to go so wrong? It all began in early 1986 when Sunrise Bandai started drafting a new work to pick up Double Zeta's baton. At the time, Sunrise received two concepts. One is Takahashi's proposal of a Double Zeta side story. The other is a feature film. 
At the same time, aside from having Gundam in the title, nothing else about it was decided at all. There were concerns regarding copyright ownership on letting outsiders be directing an official Gundam entry, but Sunrise Bandai gave a silent approval, so Takahashi began. Given this opportunity, Takahashi worked feverishly on it, as any avid Gundam fan would have. But as 1986 drew to a close, Sunrise decided the next installment would be the Shars counterattack movie proposed by Tomino himself. This wouldn't actually even be a problem on its own until some idiot bigwig at Sunrise decided to revoke all outsider Gundam licenses, which really was just directly attacking Takahashi's project, and filed for sole ownership of copyright, effectively threatening Takahashi. In anger, Takahashi decided to strike first and approach model graphics, which only had a lukewarm relationship with Bandai at the time, and were still negotiating copyright. To begin serializing Gundam Sentinel with a Model Graphics 1987 September issue before negotiations finished, the work became so extraordinarily popular that Model Graphics, who weren't on the extremely good terms with Bandai in the first place, refused to stop serializing it no matter how hard Bandai pressured them. At the same time, the merchandising for Shark's Counter Attack decided to cut down on the amount of kits to favor quality. This meant Bandai was in a hurry to find something which can succeed Shars Counterattack as a kit seller, so by the end of 1987, Bandai backed down, officially accepted Gundam Sentinel as a canon work, supported the written works, and allowed Takahashi's sole ownership of everything related to Gundam Sentinel in exchange for being granted manufacturing rights to its model kits. This made Gundam Sentinel the only Gundam work to ever not be owned by Sunrise Bandai. With the conflict resolved, the story seemingly drew to a close, but it merely lit the fuse for another conflict, and this time it involved someone who would go on to save Bandai, Hajime Kotoki. To say Gundam Sentinel was when Hajime Kotoki's career took off would not be entirely correct. At the time of publication, Gundam Sentinel merely attracted readers who were already fans of Gundam. The real project that led Kotoki's foot in the door of Bandai's Shizuoka factory was 0083. Before that, back in 1987, he was still just a little greenhorn mechanical designer artist at Shino Dosha. Studio, Zeta and Double Zeta. Who would have thought the final straw on the relationship between Takahashi and Bandai would have been Kotoki's robotic design? Gundam Sentinel designs involved many slightly raised details on flat surfaces. This had huge stress on the life of the mold and the clarity of the designs due to the model kit technologies of the time. As a result, Bandai spent massive investments in developing new kit manufacturing techniques. Gunpla staples such as clear parts and having multiple colors on the same runner, which we take for granted today, all owe their existence to this. Which in turn skyrocketed the Gundam Sentinel kit prices and made sales scarce. At the time, Gunpla on, uh, are on average 500 to 800 yen, but the Sentinel series started at 1,000. The two upgraded S Gundam kits reached 1,400, approaching the price line of uh, 1 100 scale kits. Bandai originally ceded to Takahashi as a wide business move. It means to earn money. Since the money wasn't coming in, they burned the bridge with Gundam Sentinel. From that point forward, all ties between Gundam Sentinel and Sunrise Bandai were severed. You would think the story would finally end here, right? Of course, that is not the case. Fast forward nine years to 1999, Bandai started the HGUC Gundam uh, Gunpla line marketing it as being designed under the direction of Hajime Kotoki and was decisive success as a product line. With Kotoki as a selling point, Gumpla fans waited eagerly for Gundam Sentinel designs to be dug out for it. It had been a decade after all, and being touted as one of the best works Hajime, uh, Hajime Kotoki had ever done and one of the most popular designs to boot, how could they not include it in a model kit line marketed toward the 20 to 30 year old consumers who had been praising it to high heaven? The problem lied in copyright owner Takahashi, as long as he didn't even and so much as not at Bandai, Bandai could not make the kit, so Bandai tried everything to appeal to him, up to and including sending Katsumi Kawaguchi to personally visit him as an old friend in an attempt to appeal to his emotional side. Kawaguchi had already become one of the top brass of Bandai by now. At long last, Takashi agreed to grant his rights of the images to Bandai, but not sell the rights to them. At the same time, he mandated that model graphics be given exclusive announcement rights to the Gundam Sentinel series model, and that all other magazines could only talk about it after model graphics had already done so. Bandai agreed to the terms in the end, and this was the only example where Bandai ever failed to obtain a Gundam copyright. Luckily, this time, the HGUC Gundam Sentinel kits were a success because who knows what Bandai would have done to Takahashi if it failed again. 2007 marked the 20th anniversary of Gundam Sentinel. Takahashi was interviewed in an issue of Model Graphics that year in a Gundam Sentinel 20th anniversary special, reminiscing and revealing everything that has happened between him and Bandai. I have regrettably forgotten the specific issue number as well as lost my copy among my pile of junk. In the same interview, Kawaguchi seemingly was in good company with Takahashi, both having a great time ripping on Bandai's ethics and antics in the old days. It's been a stormy 20 years, but Takahashi has won. As for the anime, Takahashi said something about it in the interview too. 
over my dead body. It may be another 20 years before it's worth asking him again. So, interesting stuff, right? Uh, it, it seems by that uh, logic, if we were to read everything, in, including the end, there is not going to be a Sentinel anime. And that's pretty interesting. Who knows what's really going on? You know, as it, I guess I say, who knows? It's all right there. But kind of, again, this was translated to, uh, translated based on interviews, based on things that have to do with personal feelings and business dealings. These two sometimes intersect with each other, sometimes take precedent over one another. And then again, we have the translation. So uh, I guess we could see what what really happened there is there was a a third party, an outside Gundam uh, fan making a story of Gundam that Bandai was going to use to develop an anime. They decided not to, but allowed them to just release the story anyway. But the creators of that story hold it dear to them. And Katoki Hajime has done a lot of great for Gundam. So it's very interesting to see where it is. Although we see Sentinel in a lot of places. We get the suits in GBO2. We get robot spirits versions that come out. We get model kits, even showing up in build fighters, I think. So Really, the only thing it's actually missing is an anime, and not everything gets an anime. Crossbone doesn't have an anime, for instance. And to follow up, this may be a similar thing they did with Thunderbolt, where they had this outside writer make a story, and it's not directly, in terms of the manga release, it's not directly tied exactly to UC Canon. Now, the animation versions are a little different, and they fit into the UC Canon somewhat. So it's very interesting. That could be another example of that happening. And I think that's pretty cool. We're, we already see where within the Gundam universe or the Gundam property, there are multiple universes that deviate from each other. I could see on top of that where Bandai has a little bit of control over uh, Gundam, but allowing other groups to make their own side stories. Kind of like how Star Wars kind of did in the 90s where people made stories, but then Disney now considers that legends. It's very interesting how that works. Anyway, that's it for story time today. I hope you found that very interesting about Sentinel. I don't think that means we'd never get an anime, but for now, we probably won't. So I guess Crossbone would be the thing to hope for. So anyway, guys, let me know what you think or if you have any other further in, uh, information or clarity to this. Maybe there's other details out there. Links will be in the description for both the original blog post and the translation. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. We'll talk later.